The magic of the Harrier is that it didn't need a runway. It was a whole new set of rules you had to learn and obey them, otherwise you wouldn't survive. It's as simple as that. It was a revolutionary fighter bomber designed to fly from combat zones and aircraft carriers and support ground forces. It was a jump jet that used VSTOL vertical and short takeoff and landing capability. And this aircraft played a vital role for the Royal Air Force in several hot and cold wars. At Tangmere Military Aviation Museum, Group Captain Jock Heron is full of admiration for the aircraft he flew for 10 years. Well, this is a Hawker Harrier, and it is the only successful VSTOL aircraft to have served in the 20th century and ran through until the beginning of the 21st century. And a magic aircraft it was. In the middle 50s, there was a recognition that airfields were vulnerable to conventional air attack and industry began to probe the idea of having an aircraft that didn't need a runway. Uh, vertical takeoff. Now, to get vertical takeoff, you need very high engine performance, and it wasn't really until the 50s and late 50s that the design of engines, the thrust to weight ratio, meant that you could put an engine in an aircraft with the weight of the aircraft and still get airborne vertically. The Hawker Siddeley Harrier was a truly unorthodox aircraft. It had a single Pegasus turbofan engine, but with the thrust directed through four nozzles that could rotate, the aircraft could fly at high speed conventionally, at slow speed vertically, and even hover. It could still reach an altitude of 55,000 feet and fly at a top speed of 730 miles per hour. It first entered RAF service in 1969 at RAF Wittering and a Sea Harrier version was later developed for the Royal Navy. Tom Lecky Thompson was an RAF test fighter pilot who had to adapt when trying out the Harrier's unconventional capability. I had to learn to fly a helicopter because in flying you're always moving forward and you use peripheral vision a lot for uh, being able to fly accurately and, and correctly. Whereas in a helicopter you're not moving forward, you're in the hover. And I didn't have any of those um, experience. So I decided to learn to fly a helicopter first. And when I'd learned to fly a helicopter, then I went back and was allowed to fly the Harrier in the hover. These graduations around here shows the date and position of the nozzles. Fully aft, conventional flight, all the way down to about here, hovering flight. Slightly forward of that, you can slow the aircraft down with a degree of vectored thrust forward, almost like reverse thrust in an airliner. The current angle is in a sort of intermediate position, which you'd probably use on a very short, what we call a rolling vertical takeoff, with the nozzle has selected to about that position. Very short ground roll, cross the car park, and then lift off. And in air combat, that is absolutely vital to have this additional uh, manoeuvrability afforded by use of, use of the nozzles. Because when you put the nozzles down, the aircraft sort of jumped up into the air about 40 or 50 feet, and it rapidly decelerated, which of course was sometimes very useful, but it also meant that you could mate anybody who was behind you and just about to shoot you down. You could get out of their line of sight and get them to fly past you, and you could then turn around and chase after them and shoot them down. These are absolutely fundamental to the ability of the aircraft to hover. They are the puffer ducts, and from below here, when the stick is deflected sideways, thrust comes out. It's opening a valve inside the fuselage, which allows the vectored thrust off the engine from the high pressure core to come out here. It's quite a high velocity and quite a lot of thrust, and it holds the aircraft laterally. There's one under the nose, to stabilize the aircraft in pitch. And if you go around to the tail, you will see there's another one underneath the tail and on either side of the tail. This controls the aircraft in yaw in the hover. And underneath here, 
is the one that we control the aircraft in pitch. If you push the stick forward, that opens and you get a forward movement of the nose. So all of these puffer ducts operating together is off directly from the stick or from the rudders. And that way you hold the aircraft in the hover manually. The modern F-35 will do it with a computer, if you believe the computer. Personally, I favour this. And the other thing we could do with the Harrier later on, when I've got more experience on it, was we could do what I call the ski stop. You know when people are skiing and they come down a hill, they take a jump, and you see them put their skis at 90 degrees to where they're travelling and up on edge? We could do that with the Harrier. You could do that, don't stand, slow down, and put it like that. And from below 500 knots, you could pull it into deep judder without overstressing the aircraft, overdoing it. And you could slow it down very rapidly like that. Then turn it up the right way, turn it into wind, and then slow down and into safe the, um, hover flight. In 1969, the RAF and Tom were given an unexpected opportunity to show the world's media how exceptional this new aircraft could be. The Daily Mail decided they wanted to have an air race, either from the GPO tower to the top of the Empire State Building or from the top of the Empire State Building to the GPO tower to commemorate the first ever crossing of the Atlantic by all Cock and Brown in 1919. And uh, so the, the, the Harrier was going to take part in that because we wanted to show that it could traverse huge distances and just be ready to go into combat immediately. I took off just after seven minutes past 10 from St Pancras, and I was at 36,000 feet taking on fuel from a tanker at 10 past 10, just north of Salisbury. I was met by a police a motorcyclist. I jumped on the back of his motorbike, went to the bottom of the Empire State Building, and then up on the lift up to the first, I think it's 88 floors, and then you have to change lifts to, to get the last few floors up to the top. And I checked in at six hours, 11 minutes and 57.15 seconds. <laughs> the Harrier was conceived and built during the Cold War. In any potential conflict with the Soviet Union, it would disperse from airfields in West Germany and use its technology to land and hide in forests and car parks. It would then quickly take off and support ground troops. But instead of warring Europe, the Harrier was unexpectedly called to action during the Falklands War. It was the only aircraft that could protect the task force. And the task force had the job of landing thousands of troops to retake the islands. And so these ships would have been down there without any air cover at all, relying on built-in missiles on the ships to take out the Argentine aircraft, which they were not capable of doing in terms of the Argentine concentrated attacks. So the Sea Harriers were there to provide A, a deterrent, and B, an active defence for the task force. The Harrier later served with distinction in Bosnia, both Gulf Wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan. In 2011, it took its final bow from Britain's Air Force and Navy to be replaced by another VSTOL aircraft, the F-35B. But for her pilots, the Harrier is the ultimate jump jet. I found it a very pleasant aircraft to fly, very easy to fly. It was very docile. Um, it had a marvellous manoeuvrability because it had been built in such a way that it, it could roll very rapidly and yet it was stable. It was adapted to light to fly. It could do things that other aircraft couldn't do in areas that other aircraft couldn't operate and that's what made it unique. 